Okay, so initially this problem, people think it's, it's either E or C. So what I want to do is I want to look at the structure of these graphs. Bless you. If we look at cosine, we're interested from 0 to pi. Um, we know that cosine repeats itself um, in between 0 and 2 pi, right? It's cosine starts at 1, so it repeats itself at 2 pi. So then halfway, it's at its minimum point, and then halfway in, betwi in between those, it's in the middle points. So it should look like that. So that's, that's what we'd be graphing for cosine x. So if we're integrating from here to here, the question is, is it not 0 or is it 0? Um, so does this, would this area equal this area? I don't know, I haven't drawn it like it should look, but it does end up being symmetric, or not necessarily symmetrical, but they're equal, and since one of them is above the x-axis and one of them is below the x-axis, this one's negative, so it cancels out this one. So this one does end up equaling 0. So the correct answer is not C. Um, so let's go back and look at maybe A before I look at, at E, just so we can get another feel for what I'm doing with this, with this graph analysis. So sine, and now we're interested from negative pi to pi. Now this to the third power, all that really is going to do is stretch out, stretch out the, the sine function. Its maximum value is still going to be 1, and its minimum value is still going to be negative 1. But it's going to, and then sine starts at 0. You all remember that? And then sine repeats itself again at 2 pi, so it's here at 2 pi. And then halfway in between 0 and 2 pi, it's at 0. And halfway in between each of those points, it's at its minimum and maximum like that. So the same thing over here. So all this to the third power does is it's going to, instead of making it nice and curved like this cosine function, it's going to make it more square. And so it's, it's really going to look a lot like a normal cosine. It's just going to look more, I guess, more bulbousy maybe. I don't, I don't know a good word to describe that. Do y'all see, see what it's supposed to look like? Does that make sense? Um, so if we're going from negative pi to pi, the question is, does this area cancel out this area? And it does. So this is also going to equal 0, so it's not a. Okay, now let's look at E. Um, so we would have a cosine. Um, going from negative pi to pi. And I'm putting, I'm putting 2 pi up there just because I know that, that's, that <clears throat> the 2 pi helps me graph it so that I know to make it start repeating itself here, so I know that at pi it's halfway, so I know that it's going to look like this. And then for if this is negative 2 pi over here, um, then it's going to look like this. So this would be cosine, but here I have cosine squared. So if I have cosine squared, hopefully you should remember that any number or any real number squared is going to be positive. So anything that's negative suddenly shoots up into the into the positive the positive y values. 
So what I'm going to now trace back over in red is the sine squared or cosine squared function. So maybe it looks kind of like a ball bouncing or something. So then the question is from bless you. The question is from negative pi to pi. Is there anything at all that's going to cancel out? Nothing is going to be neg. None of the integral parts are going to be negative, so there's nothing because there's nothing under the x-axis. So there's no way for the, any to cancel out. So e is not going to be equal to zero. And you could do the same kind of analysis with with b and d. Um, uh, the b, you might say, well, b has a a square here, so shouldn't that never be negative? But then you have to say, well, this cosine factor can be negative. So it would have a positive number, or a number that's always positive as a square, times a potentially negative number. So this one is going to have stuff that's under the x-axis that will cancel out with the stuff that's above the x-axis. So again, E is the correct answer. And that's because, because of this square, nothing will end up being negative, so nothing will cancel out. Okay, so I've added a little bit of information here. Um, that's what this information right here tells you. This is saying t equals zero, or sorry, when t equals zero, the velocity is equal to one. So that gives us this bit of information right here. The velocity evaluated at zero is equal to one. And it also gives us that the distance when t equals zero is three so that means s at zero is equal to three so we start off with acceleration and we want to get to the position function so I know that if I integrate oh I know what's happening okay. Hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I suppose you could do that. Um, I think with that, you run into the problem of missing something. Like this one, A might come out, come out to this, but then you wouldn't have this initial condition. Um, so what I would do... I know that the derivative of, derivative of position is velocity, and I know that the derivative of velocity is acceleration. So if I go the other way, the acceleration, sorry, the integral of acceleration is velocity, and the integral of velocity is position. So if I integrate the acceleration function with respect to t, then I should get um, 6t squared over 2 plus c. So that gets me 3t squared plus c. And then this bit of information tells me that if I were to put 0 in for t, I would be able to find out what this c value is. So I can say that 1 equals 3 times 0 squared plus c. So that means c equals 1. So then, dang it, come on. So then I've got my velocity function, v of t, is equal to 3t squared plus 1. And now I integrate that again so that I can get the position. So I integrate 3t squared plus 1, that gets me... 3t to the third over 3 plus 1t plus c. So the, those threes cancel out, so I don't really need to write them. And then I get, I use this information to set my position function equal to 3 if t is 0. So 0 to the third plus 1 times 0 
plus c, so that would mean that c equals 3. So then, overall, t to the third plus 1t plus 3 should be my should be my uh, position function. And looks like that's what most of y'all said at the beginning. So good job. Um, so if when you're going back and watching these, um, I haven't left enough time when I've started recording to to read the whole question. So you, when you are watching the video, you probably want to pause it and try and answer the question before you see me answer it. Um, so we're given a displacement. So we're given a position function or the distance function. Um, and we want to know when the particle changes direction. So we first have to answer the question, well, what, what thing do we need to know about to tell the direction of the particle? the directions that, it, that it's traveling. Where the, the position, all that tells us is where it is. It doesn't tell us where it's going. So what, what information tells us where the particle is going? The first derivative, the velocity function. So that, this, when it says direction, and it's given me a position function or a displacement function, that clues me in, I'm going to need to know something about the first derivative. So I'm going to go ahead and take the first derivative. So the derivative of s is, well, the 3 just drops away. And I've got to do chain rule here. Well, I don't think I actually have to do. Technically, I should do chain rule, but the chain rule is going to be very simple. And then times, so that's a derivative of the outside and times the derivative of the inside, which is just one. So then that means that the velocity function is four times t minus two to the third. So I think personally the, the most straightforward way to answer this is to do a, a first derivative test. Because the first derivative test will tell you where your function is increasing and decreasing. If your function is increasing, that means, means it's moving to the right. If it's decreasing, that means your function is moving to the left. Or if, if your velocity is positive, it's moving to the right. And if velocity is negative, it's moving left. Oh, I think I missed an N. I missed an N right there. So something that's going to help us do this is if we find any critical points first. That's going to tell us where the velocity is zero. So you should be able to see right off the bat that the critical point here is going to be two. At t equals two, the velocity is going to be equal to zero. Do y'all see that? So that if I'm looking for my, or I construct now a, one of those sine diagrams. Oops. So here's my two, and I want to know what happens on either side of the two. So if I put negative one, I don't need negative one. Zero will do just fine. And if I plug in 3, those are going to be on the either side of 2. So really what I'm, what I'm testing here, um, I know that the velocity is equal to 0 here. But that does not guarantee that the particle changes direction. If, if I end up with these both being positive, then the particle hasn't changed direction. It's just stopped momentarily and then continued on. So, or if, it, if they're both negative, then the same, the same thing. It's just... It was moving left, it stopped, and then it's moving left again. It didn't change direction. What I'm looking for is it being going from positive to negative or from negative to positive. So that's what I'm testing right now. So if I plug in 0, I get 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 to the third is going to be a negative number. A negative number times a, ne or a positive number 
gives you a negative. So then if I plug in 3, I get 3 minus 2 is 1, 1 to the third is 1, 1 times 4 is a positive 4, so it gives me a positive number. So it turns, it changes direction at this 2. That gives me a change of direction, and I found no other critical points, so there's no way that it can change direction any, any place else. Well, I say that, but it is, it would be possible for this function to change direction um, if this were not a continuous function, but this is going, since it's just a, a polynomial, because it's just a number to a power, it is going to be continuous, so that means there are no brakes or jumps, so there's your, par your car or whatever is traveling, your particle cannot make any magical jumps across an asymptote or something. So it will only change direction once. So the correct answer should be B. Sorry, I started this problem without recording. Um, one way that you can start this problem is by separating this, this integral into, into three separate integrals. Um, Another and then and then you can just do the integrals like that. Another way to do this is to try if if you like graphing. I know some of you like graphing, some of you don't. Um, yeah, you can do this one fairly easily, fairly easily without graphing. Because so we get here's the x from zero to two, and then here's the one from one to four, and then this one half x would start at um, four times one half is two, so it would start here, and then six would be three, so it would be so if this is two, four, and six, and this is one, two, and three. So here, here are my separate regions, and I can get the exact integral just by looking at the areas of the regions. So this is a triangle, so one-half base times height. This is a rectangle, base times height. This is a trapezoid, your two bases added together times your height divided by two. Um, so this area would end up being one-half two times two. This would be... Um, 1 times 2, and this area would be um, 2 plus 3 times 2 over 2. So that's, this one is 2, this one is 2, and this one is 5. <coughs> Bless you. So we end up with a total of 9.